Okay, so last but not least, we have Alejandro Ochoa. Uh, great pleasure to meet you, finally. <laughs> great, so uh, Alejandro Ochoa actually has a very impressive CV, I would say, working on different theoretical aspects of statistical genetics. And he's now an assistant professor at the um, Department of, um, let me get this right, Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Duke University. So um, today he's going to be talking about relatedness and differentiation in arbitrary population structures. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Andres. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. So uh, yeah, I am working on statistical genetics, and uh, I am today promoting a method that I think many of you will find very useful. So uh, let me start by saying you know, that uh, the data uh, that we expect is this big matrix of uh, genotypes that are encoded as zeros, ones, or twos. So we're counting uh, reference allele uh, counts, right? So for if you're homozygous for the reference, you're a two. If you're homozygous for the alternative, you're a zero. And if you're heterozygous, you're a one. And uh, we have uh, this model for genotypes, right? They're random variables that um, have an expectation that goes around their ancestral allele frequency. So this is for uh, neutral uh, loci. Uh, and then there's going to be a covariance structure where uh, there's a scale that has to do with the ancestral allele frequency, but they're, so they're also modulated by this uh, kinship coefficient that's shown in green, right? So uh, the green is the parameter that we want to estimate from this whole model. So uh, I thought this was going to be really easy. Uh, there is an estimator that's been around for, I think, like 50 years, and uh, it looks really reasonable, right? So uh, you take a very simple estimator of this ancestral allele frequency, you use it to center your genotypes, to compute uh, a scale, like a uh, sample covariance. So we were shocked to see that this is actually a method that performs, you know, they can perform really poorly depending on your data. So uh, here's the kinship coefficient that you wanted, but there's also additional terms that are undesirable, they cause a bias. And worse still, uh, the bias will depend, uh, it will change from person to person. So it's a bias that's not easy to correct when you have these estimates. So now that we identified this problem, we were able to find a new estimator based on this model, where uh, uh, essentially we realized that we could circumvent this problem of not being able to estimate these uh, PIs, these ancestral allele frequencies. So uh, uh, the new estimator, that we kind of rephrase the problem into turning, you know, so you estimate this thing, it's gonna be proportional to your kinship coefficient, but you still have some like undesired scaling factor, but now it's just one parameter. And uh, you can estimate by estimating the minimum uh, A that you're estimating. You can't just take the smallest one because that'll be too noisy. But if you average, it's going to work uh, pretty well. And then, uh, so when you do that well, you recover kinship coefficients without bias. So uh, I'm going to show you that our estimates look pretty reasonable on very you know, complex data, such as the human population. You can see here that uh, there are uh, Sub-Saharan Africans over here. Uh, Europe is here. Uh, East Asia is over here. The Americas and Oceania are here. So I arranged them so you could see really clearly how they you know, correspond to like the human migrations, right? So that the, if you look at the colors along the diagonal, they're pretty low here in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, that's what we expect because they're like the original population, right? And they increase very slowly along the diagonal so that we see the largest values in the Americas and in Oceania. Uh, this is the, the founder effect, right? The other thing that we see that's pretty reasonable, for example, is that uh, Europe and uh, East Asia share, have a higher kinship value than either do to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So you can see like the color here, the color here are lighter than the color here. Uh, now I'm gonna show you uh, the really terrible thing we obtain when we use the estimator that everybody is using right now. And by everybody, I mean uh, most of the methods that are mixed effects models use it. Uh, behind like the PCA approach, there's an estimator that looks like this too. And uh, so we get a lot of negative values. It's a little hard to see here, but uh, if you can see all these blue regions, those are parts that are negative. Even though the, uh, for the most part, kinship matrices do, you know, do not have negative values, we, we do get these estimates. People have known that this is a problem for a long time, but again, they didn't know that there were uh, more uh, complicated distortions. For example, this uh, estimate actually says that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has the greatest kinship value, so that's completely wrong. And it is also saying that uh, the kinship between Europe, East Asia, and Africa are all the same, also wrong. So uh, another interesting connection is uh, FST. So with our kinship uh, estimates that are for the whole population, that measure population structure, we can estimate uh, FST as well. Uh, we see uh, in the same data, right, that uh, when you take uh, previous methods for estimating FST, we get the same thing that people have always said FST is for humans. We get something like 10% or less. 
Uh, however, we found that uh, because the population is so complex that there really is no independence in the kinship matrix at all, that these should be biased estimators. So they are, and we do see that in simulations. And instead we get uh, an FSD estimate of 26% uh, for humans. So it's bigger than before. I don't think it's too big, but uh, it is bigger. Uh, and what I'm most excited to show you is this kinship matrix that we estimated for the Hispanic individuals in 1,000 genomes. So if you can see the colors here, there are individuals from uh, Puerto Rico, Colombia, Peru, and uh, Mexican Americans. And uh, the kinship matrix is this really smooth thing, so we ordered so that it would look smoother. I was, you know, we reordered individuals until uh, it, like, they clustered well. And so we see uh, resemblance that is not really guided so much by geography, right? It doesn't matter where they were, uh, which country they were from. What matters is the, really the ancestry. So we see that individuals that have greater Native American ancestry have greater kinship uh, with each other, right? This is, again, the founder effect that we expect. Uh, individuals that have greater European ancestry, that's uh, this uh, green color, are kind of in the middle, and people uh, with uh, greater uh, African ancestry are around the edges and have the lowest values, also what we expect. So again, to drive that last point, uh, an individual that is a Mexican-American that has large Native American ancestry clusters more closely with Peruvians that have greater Native American ancestry than with other Mexican-Americans who have maybe less Native American ancestry, right? That's really where the signal's coming from. So uh, with that, I just want to mention that uh, these better kinship estimates are sure to uh, improve how we do genome-wide association studies. And I'm currently working on uh, building new methods that uh, are really built from the ground up, right, uh, from the kinship model. And with that, I'd like to thank my former advisor, John Story, who's at Princeton. Thank you. All right, excellent timing in the last three talks, so perfect before they kick us out from the auditorium, right? <laughs> so until what time we have exactly 6 p.m.? Okay, perfect. So we still have time for questions. Hi, nice talk. Um, have you actually applied this new kinship estimator to improve some previous U.S. analysis done? Just wondering. Uh, I haven't yet. So it's surprising that uh, in some settings it doesn't seem to make much difference, uh, but there are sure to be cases where there are. But I think the problem is also that uh, I have a beef with existing methods, <laughs> right? People, when they do uh, PCA corrections or they do the mix of X models, uh, and if essentially they're including population structure as this covariate, why is it a covariate? Right? Think about that. <laughs> I think that uh, there are probably, I mean, I'm, I'm coming up with a method where uh, the, the covariate uh, assumption comes from, uh, yeah, the, the trait has to be highly polygenic. There's like a, things that have to happen for that to make sense. But population structure is still a confounder, even for Mendelian disorders, right? And uh, so, th so there, th I think there's a better way to do all of this. One last question, maybe? No? Okay, great, because that gives us a little bit of time to um, final announcements, thanks, and et cetera, et cetera. So, I'll give it back to Alicia. So thank you again. Uh, congratulations. Thank you.